Mark Smith with you on LBC on a Tuesday evening. With me between now and nine, a man who says he learnt the art of fiction from writing obituaries. Richard Gordon wrote the first of his doctor books, Doctor in the House, in 1952. His 17th has just been published, making it one of the longest-running and most successful series of comic novels ever. Richard Gordon, good evening. Good evening. I hope I got the number right. Uh, yes, I hope so, but I <laughs> would very much like to point out to your listeners that this 17th one is my great political novel. You know, like the Prime Minister by Trollope and Disraeli's Sybil and that sort of thing. Why did you decide to actually venture into uh, writing great political novel? Yes. Ah, well, um, the, this is about an MP whose psychiatric report is leaked to the Sunday papers. And I mentioned the plot to a member of the upper house who said there must be 650 psychiatric reports hanging about somewhere. Uh, and I always thought the great charm of politics, of course, is that you can always identify your own progress with that of the country. And everyone, of course, wants to be prime minister. We've just seen this with the Westland affair. Not because they want personally to be prime minister, but it would be a wonderful thing for the country, you see. And uh, I've also allows me in this to have a few smacks at a well-known institution, the National Health Service. In fact, there's a warning printed on the back of the book, the NHS can damage your health. I think, if you, I think that's rather an unnecessary warning. Everybody knows that. See, when the NHS was uh, started, I was writing these obituaries in which... May, may I tell you my oldest joke? My Go oldest, ahead. My I oldest like joke jokes. is that I, I went along to the British Medical Journal uh, and uh, I had the bright idea of starting a doctor's comic column and I was put in charge of the obituaries and this is where I learned how to write convincing fiction we had a sort of code you know because uh, if we put in uh, oh he suffered fools badly we meant that he was about the rudest man within miles and if we said he was a man of Hibernian temperament he drank a lot yeah <laughs> and if he was a man with problems he drank secretly but anyway with all this I started writing uh, Doctor in the House my first book and at that time, the National Health Service was being started and causing a great kerfuffle in the medical profession. Well, since then, the National Health Service has not really changed. Um, it, in fact, was completely reorganized after about 30 years, so thoroughly that after five years afterwards, they had to reorganize it all over again. And it's still chaotic. Sounds like bureaucracy, doesn't it? It is. And that's a great pity. You've written, as I said, uh, and I think I'm right, 17 uh, doctor books. Surely there is a limit to the number of comic situations you can create for your doctor figure to get into. Oh, I expect so, but they sort of go on. Um, I think that if you have a good character and you have some ideas, uh, you can always create something new. Uh, for instance, in this case, the poor doctor gets into all sorts of scrapes uh, because he's involved with the terrible leakage. And uh, I think you may find some, um, some of the things you've seen in the newspaper recently I've been able to put into the book. However, um, this is uh, w it's one of the things in the book. There are other things as well in which... Um, I find the poor doctor is um, getting into trouble with one of his patients who's in a hospice and is, in fact, dying. It's terrible. Well, in fact, he isn't at all, really, which upsets the hospice terribly. I mean, can you imagine? <laughs> yes, it, uh, it seems to be the, the ultimate in trickery, yes, really, really, being in a hospice and not, not actually dying at I all. I know. Nobody ever goes out like that, you see, <laughs> and he walks out. Terrible. Um, anyway, the, really, the uh, point about the politics in it is that uh, you have um, this politician who is... Uh, uh, a rather pushy sort of fellow, and um, I'm sure you must have had one or two of them which you've interviewed in the show. And he is not in the slightest interested in health, really, like a lot of politicians, except his own, of course. Uh, but they're all interested in the National Health Service because it affects all of us from before we are born till after we are dead. It's a useful political weapon. And everyone wants to mess about with it. This, of course, is the great tragedy of the Health Service. Do you think it is used widely that cynically? Is it used that cynically, in a, in a widespread uh, way? Uh, I wouldn't like to say anything about the cynicism of politicians. I'm sure they're all terribly, sort of, um, really blue-eyed chaps. But um, anyway, um, this one is uh, not a blue-eyed chap, and he's the greater uh, thing he wants to have is a hospital named after him. Because when you have a hospital named after you in your constituency, uh, then, of course, you're there for life, because everyone can see your name in the best possible light. Pure advertising. Pure advertising. Mm -hmm. Let's hear your first musical choice. Well, I have a very interesting record, this, because I've got a very interesting story about it. Um, it's not one of your old jokes? No. Oh, right. It's even, even older than that. Fine. Uh, Beethoven, you know, suffered, like we writers do, from writer's block. He couldn't write anything, you know, terrible. And one morning, he was sitting in Vienna, in the Beethoven house, uh, at the piano, and he couldn't write a note. And he banged the piano and said, Ugh! 
uh, he was German, of course. Mm. Uh, I am finished. I am kaput. And at that moment, in came the pretty little maid with her feather duster, which she flicked over all the bits of furniture, saying, Oh, Herr Beethoven, don't worry. Something will come. Something will come. <laughs> Part of the opening movement of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, that's Richard Gordon's first musical selection this evening, and we'll be talking further in a moment. Mark Smith on LBC, I'm talking to Richard Gordon. Why did you initially want to be a doctor? Because when you began studying medicine, doctors didn't have, as they do today, the incentive of a fairly decent salary at the end of it, even. It was so long ago, I have completely forgotten. You don't remember having no. a vacation or anything like that? <laughs> no. This is, after all, this, I took up medicine about 1938, if you can imagine it not very far from where we're sitting, at St. Bartholomew's Hospital, uh, where two of my children have since um, been students and become doctors. Um, so um, it is too long to remember what motivated me. I suppose I thought it was a rather jolly sort of interesting job, which it is. Of course, in those days, there was none of this nonsense about getting jolly good O-levels and A-levels. You went along there, and if you looked respectable with a white collar, and particularly if you played rugger, and you weren't actually... Well, that was important, wasn't it? Oh, very, very important, yes. Mm. Uh, and if you weren't actually rude and you, you were in. In fact, I don't think the dean selected anybody. His secretary, an old boy, was set outside. Anyone he disliked the look of, he sent them over the, over the river to go into Guy's, you see. And Guy's was seen as a step down from Bart's. Oh, it is. We all know that at Bart's. It's well known. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, that was a long time ago. And then I uh, said I got a job in the British Medical Journal. Before that, I'd been an anaesthetist. I, I took up anaesthetics. It's rather good. You get a seat in the operating theatre. I would imagine, though, that uh, it's not a job with much variety, that of an anaesthetist. Uh, no, not really. So I had plenty of time to start writing books, which I did. Uh, and um, my very first book, of which I'm extremely proud, was Anaesthetics for Medical Students. It's a very small book, uh, which has helped a large number of medical students through the examination in anaesthetics which they have to take and which they have no interests whatever quite rightly probably it's also it's, it's a very small direct book you can put it next to the patient's head on the operating table and look up the index blue patients turning I'm what to do i'm never going to get go into hospital again <laughs> oh no it's, well, it's quite safe you know but, uh, the book's out of print now uh, anyway, after this of course i worked on these bitterers and then that got a bit much so i ran away to see uh, as a ship's doctor, in, in comfort. And I uh, signed on a cargo boat sailing to uh, Australia from Liverpool. Uh, and either um, I got it wrong somehow, but it went via Newfoundland, a rather long way round. And I don't think the crew really trusted me. They, if you go up to them, you know, as a ship's doctor, and you say, can I help you? They say, no, I think we'll wait till we get to port and see a proper doctor. And I had nothing to do all day except... Uh, drink whiskey with the chief engineer who came from Glasgow, because all chief engineers come from Glasgow. Uh, and only to save myself, really, getting cirrhosis of the liver, I sat down and wrote Doctor at Sea. Well, when I came home, um, Doctor in the House came out, and then Doctor at Sea came out. I'd gone back to getting anaesthetics, where I married my assistant, a f female, uh, and um, after that I uh, gave up anaesthetics and became writer, because it fulfilled a childhood uh, bizarre, which is very important to childhood bizarre, and in Freud can tell you all about that. And my great childhood bizarre was to be a comic writer like P.G. Woodhouse. Well, I haven't been as good as P.G. Woodhouse, but at least I've followed. You uh, qualified in 1945. You gave up medicine uh, seven years after that. That's right. Do you think in that seven years you amassed enough knowledge of the profession? Do you now wish you'd stayed on as a doctor a bit longer, perhaps? Now, that's an extremely interesting question you've asked. Shall I tell you why? because I instantly lost all interest in medicine, I suppose. But, uh, you know, it's very difficult. My children began to grow up, and like all children do, they began to ask very awkward questions, like, Daddy, what is the normal blood pressure? And, Daddy, what are the normal constituents of urine? And, Daddy, how do you deliver a breach? I never used to ask my father questions like that, and he's a doctor. Oh, well, <laughs> perhaps you're, you're much more considerate. <laughs> Maybe. So I had to learn uh, a lot of medicine in order to keep up with them. And then my wife went back to work, and so in order to talk to anybody at all in the family, I know, now know far more medicine than I did when I qualified. When the first Doctor book came out, how was it received? Was it an instant hit? Were you, were you a success from the word go? Uh, well, again, it's a long time ago. It seemed to be all right. Of course, things were much denser in those days. Um, it was all rather cosy. Books, no, nobody bought paperbacks. They all bought hardback books. Um, 
I can't remember. And then nobody wanted to make a film of it. And then Betty Box came along, Betty who's still around, and she got uh, the chap who is now an English author but was then an English actor, mm -hmm. Dirk Bogard, uh, to play the starring role. Well, this, of course, was very difficult because uh, he had to play it with all the fun came from being scored off, which is a difficult thing to do. But in that movie we had James Robertson Justice, and he was a man who always, I'm sure you always remember him from the old films, you see him, uh, and he was a man who said, uh, I am a, not an actor, but as the producer often said, he always seems to want an actor's money. And he really made, so he created Sir Lancelot Sprat. Uh, not the idea. ultimate in pomposity, wasn't it? It was wonderful, right. really, but it was very good and it was very clever, and he was also very believable. Uh, and when he died, that was the end of the series. We never made any more. Did you envisage the first book as the first of a long series? Did you actually no, see it stretching? not at all. As long but as you has. know, as one goes on, as, as P.G. Woodhouse once said, every author must guard against growing side whiskers, writing articles on the modern girl, and writing a series. It's very difficult to stop. All three. Writing is, uh, obviously, unless you're consistently successful, a, a very insecure career. Oh, Lord, yes. Were you that sure of yourself as a writer when you gave up medicine? Or uh, were you not looking into the future? Well, I always remember it was very, very difficult. I was working as an anaesthetist in Oxford, and uh, I made this terrible decision that I was going to give up the healing art, which I had to put to my boss, the professor. And I always remember what he did. He put his arm in a fatherly way around my shoulders and said, My boy... I think in your case, you made absolutely the right decision. Do you think it was right? I don't know. I'd better ask him. He's still alive. <laughs> Every doctor um, has a favourite story, something disastrous or oh, something I comic must, that's happened. I must tell you... Do you have one? Yes. You must do. The two-and-a-half-minute leg. Right. I'm always telling the story of the two-and-a-half-minute leg. I, I haven't heard it. Good. Surprise. Oh, uh, how nice to find <laughs> somebody in London who has it. <laughs> well, uh, this is a story about a famous surgeon in the middle of the last century, called Robert Liston, who was very proud that he could remove a leg in two and a half minutes. That's pretty quick. Uh, but that was before anaesthesia, you see, uh, when more haste meant less pain. And uh, he was a very vain man. He used to have his students with their watches timing him, like a prize fighter. Well, on one occasion, he removed the leg in two and a half minutes. But the gentleman's um, sex life um, went with it. Uh, the other occasion, he removed the leg under two and a half minutes, so the patient died afterwards in the ward from hospital gangrene. They always did in those days. He also cut off the fingers of his young assistant, who died afterwards in the ward from hospital gangrene. They always did in those days. And he slashed through the coattails of a distinguished doctor who was watching, who, terrified that the knife had pierced his vitals, dropped dead from fright. Now... That is the only operation in history with a 300% mortality. <laughs> You've never had an experience as dis anywhere near as disastrous as that, obviously. Anesthesia has of course, made things easier. Changed a lot. Uh, although you've written nearly 40 books, which averages out at uh, over one, one a year since you started writing, yes, is, yeah. that's prolific by most standards. Have you always found it easy to write? You mentioned writer's block earlier. Have you ever gone through a stage where you have been staring at the blank page? Oh. The, well, uh, what I do is, you see, I, I do it all on the hoof. Uh, I live in um, the suburbs, uh, and I have some very nice woods near us, uh, Petswood. And I take my dog uh, with my little tape recorder, it used to be a notebook, in the woods. And I go out there every day thinking my thoughts. And uh, I am always in danger of being arrested because they say I'm a nutter who is talking to the trees, if not about to commit sexual assault upon them. Well, over the years, I've worked it out that I have walked so far every afternoon that I have walked all around the world and I have reappeared in the suburbs of San Francisco. I have worn out innumerable pairs of shoes, two spaniels, one beagle, and half of an English setter. And I find that walking in the woods with a tape recorder is very stimulating and I uh, put my little notes, ideas, on the paper. Uh, and then I come home and write them all out. Uh, this actually was a very good routine, which, as you said, produced 46 books. This come to a grinding halt because I have bought myself a word processor. I was going to say, have you caught up yes. with new technology yet? and it's right. like the beagle I had, which was extremely disobedient and never sat when I said sit. And I wrote something the other day and it vanished into thin air. 
and I wrote very rude words all over it. The thing came up saying, don't talk to me like that. <laughs> Your second musical choice this evening? Well, now, I've got an interesting story about this one, too. Uh, some years ago, uh, I stayed in a hotel in Paris over the Musée Grévin, which is French for the waxworks. And in this hotel was a long salon. And in this salon was a plaque which said, E.C., that's here, uh, Rossini, that's Rossini, Ecri, that's wrote, L'Opera, that's the opera, Guillaume Tell, which is William Tell. And I imagined Rossini, pretty big chat Rossini, striding up and down this long salon saying, mm, did he dum, did he dum, did he dum, what next? Ah, dum dum! This is the William Tell Overture. The Overture from William Tell by Rossini. That's Richard Gordon's second musical choice this evening. We'll be talking further after the news and sport on LBC. Mark Smith on LBC on a Tuesday evening. I'm talking to Richard Gordon. Among the many books uh, you've written, Richard, uh, are books about the lives of uh, Florence Nightingale, Dr. Crippen, and Jack the Ripper. Three very different characters with one thing in common, the, the medical connection, of course. Yes, the um, Nightingale one was um, well traumatic in many ways. Um, uh, Florence Nightingale, of course, was... Not a, was not a good nurse. She didn't nurse at all. She got dirty nurses to do the dirty work. Uh, but she was a wonderful administrator and politician. Uh, she would have been in the cabinet today and might even have got the National Health Service running efficiently. I think she would have done. Uh, also, I think, for well-substantiated evidence, she was lesbian. Well, uh, I, that's a very small part of the book, but it made a very big part in what the Sunday papers wrote about it the day before it came out. Now, on the Monday, we were going to have a press conference uh, in St. Thomas's Hospital, which was, of course, uh, as far as Nightingale's Hospital, and I arrived at my publisher's office, and there was the publicity man, ashen-faced, saying, the matron of St. Thomas's says the press conference is off. What do we do? I say, we do nothing. When a matron says something is off, it stays off. So we had the press conference on the pavement instead. But it was a very small part of the book, but I really found that uh, she was such an admirable woman that it's a great pity she simply looked upon as an angel of mercy, which does not take a great deal of intelligence. Yes, the popular image was of her as an angel, her only motive of caring for the fellow man. Exactly. Was, was that the case? Or no. did she have... Well, she did moment? care for the fellow man, but anyone can care for your fellow man, but you've got to, if you've got to be pretty efficient to be able to turn that desire into something practical in extremely adverse circumstances. Now, there's something else about her which I found out. Uh, I always carry her picture in my pocket, don't you? Uh, no, I'm afraid I don't. A ten-pound note. Good <laughs> heavens, don't they pay you better here? Uh, I forgot. Uh, and on the ten-pound note, and if you walk down um, near Piccadilly, you'll see her statue opposite the Athenaeum Club. She's holding the famous lamp, which is like an Aladdin's lamp. Well, she didn't have that sort of lamp at all. Uh, she had a Turkish lamp, which was rather like a Chinese lantern with a candle in it. And the soldiers were supposed to kiss her shadow as she passed. Well, I was at St. Thomas's, and nurses very kindly invited me there one evening and lit the lamp and turned out the light, and I can guarantee you couldn't kiss anything in its light. It's, it's the kind of stuff legends are made exactly. from. What about uh, Jack the Ripper? Uh, there is uh, a claim, uh, well, various claims, all of them fairly well substantiated, that he was a medical man. He was a surgeon or something. Well, yes, he went for what they used to call a certain organ, that uh, in these days we say was the uterus, uh, and he used to remove it. Now, it's jolly difficult to do. It lies a long way in the um, pelvis. In fact, um, if I may say so, on the operating table sometimes, an extremely good light and expert in charge, I found certain difficulties in um, operating in this area. So he must have known what he was up to. He, you know, he did all this in the dark, with, very quickly, all the, and on the pavement with a long knife, so he must have known what he was looking for. And he took out these wounds of these unfortunate ladies. And, uh, of course, anyone who walked about with a little black bag in London at that time was suspected of having one of these organs in it, and even though it was the liver for the cat's dinner or something. And also, uh, his crimes were meant to have been, well, that's an another theory, they were meant to, were meant to have been covered up uh, because he had a royal connection. Oh, well, this is all a lot of rubbish, you see. Uh, that story was put about by the Irish, who are not frightfully keen either on the royalty or about um, the essential truth in this matter, and I know there's all these things. There is no evidence whatever 
that he was anybody, but he, that he was probably a doctor or somebody who knew what he was up to. He wasn't a slaughter man because the anatomy of the animals is quite different. Anyway, um, that is uh, the thought I've always had about Jack the Ripper, and I always walk around this area of London. I still think about him. Um, and when I go down by the London Hospital, which it all happened, where my daughter works, uh, and you can still feel he's walking down those streets, perhaps he is. What about Dr. Crippen? What well, was he was an interesting was man, yes. Um, he was a rather pathetic man. He, uh, the theory that uh, was advanced afterwards by a famous QC is no good uh, advancing a theory afterwards, really, when the chap's been hanged, but uh, was that he merely gave this hyacinth a very strong drug, which was found in his wife's body, um, to damp down her sexual appetites, and he got the dose wrong. Being a doctor, I can quite understand that. Uh, and uh, he knocked her off, and then he cut her up, which is rather stupid of him. But her head, you know, has never been found. It's around London somewhere. Perhaps you ought to get a little hunt, going, finding Mrs. Crippin's head. Maybe we shouldn't. Oh. What's, what's your fascination with the darker side of human nature? Well, it's not really the darker side. It just happens that these people, uh, this was an interesting thing, because it was the medical connection. I mean, any murder is pretty dark, whether it's, however it's committed. It doesn't make much difference to the victim. Let's hear your third musical choice, and uh, this is uh, the second movement of Berlioz's Symphony of ah, yes. Why this? I, I am a great dreamer, and nothing is more dreamy than this, is it? Part of the second movement of Berlioz's Symphony Fantastique, The Waltz. That's uh, Richard Gordon's third musical selection this evening. We'll be talking further in a moment. Mark Smith on LBC with Richard Gordon. You hit the headlines somewhat uh, in 1974 when you were approached by a certain ubiquitous Irishman oh, yeah. carrying a big red book who said, Richard um, Gordon, this is your life. Yes, well, we do like to tell you about it. Oh, do, do. Uh, it's, it's extremely complicated, um, because usually uh, when they put you on this show, what's it called, that show? Um, this is your life. Oh, that's right. Yes, this is your life. Uh, when they put you on that, they do the bit where they find the victim, they put it on tape, just in case, perhaps, or it's impossible to think it would ever happen, some awkward chap actually walks out. And Danny Blanchflower, a well-known footballer, he walked out, but he was on tape. Anyway, uh, I should have been suspicious. Uh, it was just before the election, one of the elections, and uh, the TV executive took me out to an enormously posh lunch, sent back the wine for something better, you know, paid the bill like Dr. Bernardo on Christmas Day. And he said, now, don't go away. A car will come and take you to do a little commercial, which I knew all about, for your doctor series, which was then running on London weekend. Uh, and the car appeared, a lovely great big car, uh, with the producer, and uh, it went off into the night. Now, what had happened was, because of the election, uh, they said they couldn't use their studio, but in fact they had a strike at the studio. And so they had to do this live. And so they had to use the time uh, before the show went on, with me under their control, and uh, drive me around North London. They told me I was going to some small studio, you know, it was all made up. And when I passed the grace gates of Lords, with which I'm familiar, for the fourth time, I said, this isn't, this is your life, is it? Whereupon the driver hit a bollard. Anyway, I went in, and there was Evan Andrews, and I said to him, when he said, this is your life, I said, what we doctors call, gonads. <laughs> How did he react? I saw him after, he said, it's been a terrible day. <laughs> Why did, you, why did you do that? Why did you not want to appear on it? Well, because the year before, I had appeared uh, on Monica Dickens' This Is Your Life, and I made it clear. I said, if ever they do this to me, I should walk out. They did it to me, so I walked out. Does the idea of uh, people from your past suddenly appearing horrify you? Uh, people even that I know quite well today appearing horrify, uh, horrify me. You do keep yourself to yourself. I mean, you, you will do the occasional interview, but not a lot. You're not often seen on television. You're not often heard on the radio. Oh, I, is only, that go a policy? On, I only go on the very best programs. But of course, yes. <laughs> is, is that a policy of yours, to, to space yourself, uh, your appearances out? I should love to say so, but people don't ask me very much. <laughs> is, that, is that really true? Well, I do a bit of it. Um, I always think that it's uh, part of the job. If you write a book, you've got to go and publicise it. Uh, and it's very much easier to sit talking to you uh, than actually sitting down with my word processor, which, as you know, infuriates me. Have you mastered it completely? Though? No, no, it's mastered me completely. I'm only hoping, see, I thought I just pressed a button and it wrote the next book. But it doesn't seem to work like that. Perhaps I bought the wrong make.
You, you've got uh, four children. Of the four, three have gone into medicine. You were saying earlier that it's more difficult now to get into medicine. Is it much more difficult than oh, when far. you were studying? It's entirely different, you see. I mean, they brought all this damn academic nonsense into it, you see. We had to be... Now, you don't think that's necessary? Oh, yes, it is. I'm afraid so, for the patient's sake. But in our day, it was all... Everything was much more relaxed. Uh, if you, ha you had to have brains, when you had to have enough sense to get whatever they called A-levels in those days. But none of this great competition that they have today, it's very difficult to get in. Of course, everyone wants to be a doctor. Uh, and uh, it is very interesting for me that two of my children are at my old hospital of St. Bartholomew's, which is just down the road. And it's rather like going to the old school. The National Health Service was created uh, three years after you qualified. It became, for a while, the, the envy of the world. Ah, no, yes, the envy of all civilised nations, I believe, the politicians yes. used to say. Yes. What about its present state? Health well, cuts, overworked staff and so on. Well, this is all a rubbish, you see. Um, the, Na the National Health Service, like the quality of mercy, is, appropriately, twice blessed because it uh, treats, the, treats the sick. It also provides a lot of jobs uh, and a lot of kudos for a lot of people who otherwise would not have either. So when the government tries to get some value for money and tries to organise things, screams go up from the unions, the Royal College of Nursing, and from a large number of prima donna doctors. Now, these cuts which we've all heard about are not real cuts, but they have been very useful because they have made the country realise that health is very expensive. And if we wanted, we could spend our entire national income on health. But there are hospitals closing. There are hospitals that exactly. don't have enough beds because, and so on. But you see, there are hospitals closing and hospitals have not enough beds because the, there is a certain limit on the amount of money which we can spend on health. And there is also an efficiency which we lack in it. Do you think, though, that patients aren't now suffering, say, more than they were 10, 20 years ago? No. Because of no. the, the, no. the tightening up on the spending? No. I think the tightening up the spending is necessary. The National Health Service works very well because we're very good in Britain on health, doctoring and nursing. Uh, we're not... The re British medicine used to be the best in the world. It isn't now. The Americans have got the edge there. But we are very good at the Florence Nightingale condition, tradition. And if Florence Nightingale could manage in Scutari, I think that quite a lot of people in this country could manage with infinitely better resources without complaining so much. People complete, always complain. They don't make any effort to try and cope with a budget which is not, in fact, reduced been increased. I'm sounding like a politician, but I, I'm not being political. I want to put it fairly straightly, which has been increased. Uh, and people will not, do not like to be organised properly, and, do not, and they, well, they don't like to have anything changed. It's a great British tradition. The other great British tradition, of course, is that we never pay for the dreary things of life, like sickness or in pensions or motorways. Would you like to see the American type of system where health is private and one is insured? I think privately. that, well, I think there should be more of that. I think that the, obviously you've got to have a national health service essential for people who cannot afford because we live on a much lower income level in this country generally. But I think that uh, the people who could afford, you see, the national health service which was created by Naiba Van to keep the poor out of an early grave now manages to save a lot of middle class people who could afford it uh, to skimp themselves buying a new car. And I believe that people, you know that fuss they had about paying for your children's higher education uh, instead of having a grant at a certain level of income. Well, but they, we, we do. Uh, we all pay for education by taxation indirectly. Yes, but then I'm, I'm coming back to the British idea that nobody... We all pay. But, I mean, people should pay themselves for uh, health insurance, which a lot of people do. I think people should pay, if they can afford it, for their GP. Uh, because they get a lot of services and they're GP free. As an alternative to that, I would like to suggest that the church did more, because most people who go to the GP are not, in fact, clinically ill. Uh, they are suffering from their emotions or the emotions of others. Uh, you know, I feel all tense, doctor, and things. Now, the church, by tradition and training, is deal with all this. And so they shouldn't go to the doctor, or he should refer them to the vicar. The church, however, cannot prescribe antidepressants. And that's the idea. Why they don't need to. Surely they are trained to give solace and that sort of thing. But I will say that I have put this idea to several ministers who are not frightfully enthusiastic. I think they think it might interfere with their gardening. 
Your books over the years have made millions of people laugh. Briefly, what, what makes you laugh? Oh, nothing makes me laugh very much. You're, you're a bit of a miserable person, oh, so I... Oh, frightfully. You mentioned uh, Woodhouse, though, earlier. Uh, oh, he's Woodhouse, one of your heroes. Well, of course, Woodhouse is a genius. And one of the great things about admiring a genius is that uh, it saves you from uh, that uh, thing which a lot of authors have, which is envy. If a man is a genius, you do not need to envy him. Richard Gordon, thanks for being with me in the last hour. Uh, Richard Gordon's new book, Doctor in the Soup, is published by Century at £8.95. And uh, on to your final musical selection. Well, you said I was miserable. It was that Eminem Andrews who said that, but I really like jolly things. I don't like miserable music. No Wagner for me. And this is a very jolly little piece of music. This is Scott Joplin's The Entertainer. <laughs> 